I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. You're watching a young woman's last minute alive caught on surveillance video. It's just devastating when you can't keep them safe. 26-year-old Katie Jones mysteriously gunned down after leaving a bar in a safe neighborhood. The only clues are in this chilling video. That car was the car that had her killer in it. If it was a robbery gone bad, why wasn't anything stolen? If it was a hit, who wanted her dead? Crime Watch Daily on the case in North Carolina. Katie's death has been described as the perfect crime. No witnesses, no suspects. Then... My stepdaughter fell down the stairs. Heartbreaking. She's still unconscious. Yes. A beautiful baby girl gone. But did she fall or was she beaten to death? Something very horrible happened to this little girl. Her father's fiance convicted of murder. Is it possible that you lost your temper? Our Michelle Sagona goes behind bars for the very first interview with Emily DeFries. Why she's pointing the finger at an eight-year-old. It's not inconceivable. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, some people have called it the perfect murder. No witnesses, no fingerprints, no motive. Michelle Sagona is in North Carolina now with new details on the hunt to find the person who killed Katie Jones. A young woman's final moments are captured on surveillance video. That camera got her walking down this sidewalk. At some point, she's confronted. Correct. And Charlotte police, hoping to catch her killer, share the video with only us. Like, it really looked like someone shot her and left. It's midnight on Friday at a bustling bar in the college town of Charlotte, North Carolina. A couple of hours later, after last call, 26-year-old Katie Jones and her friends leave the bar. What kind of a person was she? Her just energy and her charisma. She, she just, it was disarming and overwhelming and very spontaneous and spunky. So when her friends offer this free spirit a ride home... She said, no. She's like, are you crazy? This is one of the last warm nights of the year. I'm not missing this. I mean, she loved to walk. Did Katie walk home alone at night frequently? Yeah, like every night. But Katie's mother says there was no reason for her daughter to feel worried about walking home. After all, it was a busy weekend night in this very safe college town. There were plenty of lights, plenty of people around. It wasn't something that she would have had any reason to fear. She'd been doing it for five years. How far is the walk? About a mile. And during her walk home, Katie is posting nonstop photos to friends. She was communicating with her friends um, on her walk home, taking photos of landmarks along her walk on Central Avenue and sending them out on a um, Facebook chat that had a group of people from work in it. Her text messages seemed very normal, um, no concern or distress. And according to her friends on the chat, Katie appears to be dancing and singing. She was dancing all the way. She appeared to be happy and jovial and was skipping along, is that right? Yes. Dancing and skipping towards her death as soon as she turns the corner. She was shot. Where was she struck? She was struck through the side. It actually punctured her heart and her lung through the side. A resident walking his dog believes someone is setting off fireworks in the parking lot of a nearby business. So he walked down there to see what was going on and then he saw her laying there. And even though the Good Samaritan neighbor found her within minutes of the shooting and called 911, it was still too late. She was already gone. She was already gone. Katie's mother had just spoken to her daughter three days before the fatal shooting. They had made plans to see each other in two weeks. It's just devastating. 
when you can't keep them safe, there's nothing you can do. It's done. Your chance to keep them protected and loved and saved is over. You failed. Right away, cops canvassed the area and interview neighbors and friends of the beloved 26-year-old. Were you able to uncover anyone who had any issues with Katie? No. Everyone loved Katie. Investigators appear to hit a dead end. Then they discover surveillance video from a building directly across from where the shooting occurred. Could there be evidence on the video that could point them to Katie's killer? Coming up. Katie's death has been described as the perfect crime. No witnesses, no suspects. There are no witnesses who have come forward. That doesn't mean that there are no witnesses. Police get a big break in the case they are sharing only with us. You have some video of Katie prior to the shooting. Yes. But the surveillance video doesn't just capture Katie, it also reveals something else. That car was the car that had her killer in it. It was an ordinary night. Waitress Katie Jones had finished her shift at a popular restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina. However, as she walked home in the early morning hours, the 26-year-old would be targeted for death. 26-year-old Katie Jones has been shot to death just a couple streets away from her Charlotte, North Carolina home. I still can't imagine what I'm going through. And I keep looking for something that I'm missing and I can't find it. She was a big presence. A presence now gone, leaving so many unanswered questions. Who do you think could have done this to her? I think, like, realistically, it could have literally been anyone. Following the shooting, police conduct dozens of interviews. We have interviewed pretty much anybody who was close to Katie, either at that point in time or leading up to that point in time. But unfortunately, it hasn't given us any actionable leads at this point. It hasn't materialized into anything yet. Correct. The investigation appears to stall. Then cops catch a break, kicking the case back into high gear with the discovery of surveillance video. The explosive video evidence shows Katie walking home, following drinks with some restaurant co-workers on the night she was gunned down. That camera got her walking down this sidewalk. Correct. Now, Charlotte police are asking for the public's help by releasing the footage for the very first time to Crime Watch Daily. Surveillance cameras or cameras in the area. There was one. Correct. Any more than one or just the one shot? There are cameras all around here, but the only one that caught anything that relevant it? to this case is going to be the one across the street there. Frame by frame, the video documents Katie's final moments in the early morning hours of October 15th, 2016. It's 2.40 a.m. when Katie first comes into view of the camera's lens. She's captured walking down Central Avenue in an area in Charlotte known as Plaza Midwood. She comes from there. She walks down. She makes a left. A left onto the plaza headed towards Hammerton Place. Little does Katie know, she's got less than a minute to live. On the video, she disappears into the shadows of the trees in the house right there. And while at this point on the video, Katie is out of sight, at the same time, something else comes into focus. You can see headlights from a vehicle appear in the screen for a very, very brief moment. That's right. A mystery car appears to pull right next to the parking lot driveway where Katie's body is later discovered. Is it to the driveway entrance? Yes. Where this happens? Yes. And what you know is that there's definitely a vehicle that comes down this street, right? Correct. It approaches from this direction. From this direction? Yes. So the vehicle's coming from this direction and then out? Yes. And then where was she shot in this area? Uh, so she was located um, right around this area. Do you believe the gunman was in that vehicle? I think so, yes. But Detective Eisenhower doesn't believe it's a drive-by shooting. Personally, I think somebody got out of the car okay. um, and approached her for her to be this far over from the sidewalk where from the she sidewalk. originally was. And there's something else. 
I think it was a complete surprise to her. Based on that video, it doesn't really appear that she would have had time to defend herself. And if she had the chance to defend herself, her friends say she would have done just that. She clearly knew what she was doing. She had pink pepper spray with her at all times. And she had her phone. Yep. And she would yell if she had the opportunity to. Definitely. So if not a drive-by, could Katie's shooting be the result of a robbery gone bad? In recent years, Charlotte's robbery unit has seen a spike in targeting late-night restaurants and their employees. And on the night Katie was killed, she was on her way home from an after-work hangout with some fellow restaurant co-workers. Was there anything taken from her? Not that we could tell. In fact, Katie's phone was found in her back pocket, her purse with money still inside it, lying next to her. It didn't make sense. Nothing was missing on her body. Like, it really looked like someone shot her and left. But police believe it still could have been an attempted robbery, and they have a theory as to why nothing was taken. Take another look at the surveillance video. At 2.41 a.m., the headlights of the suspected shooter's car appear right next to where Katie would have been walking. Then, just 21 seconds later, the driver appears to slam the car in reverse and abruptly backs up. But why? So the shot or the shots that were fired were so loud that this alarm sounded. Yes. That's right. The gunfire sets off the nearby business's alarm system. Could it be the shooter got spooked and didn't have enough time to rob Katie? So this alarm sounding, there's gunfire erupting, and she's basically right here on the ground. Correct. Then, seconds after backing up, what appears to be the same car comes back into view and races from the scene, then out of camera range. Cops haven't been able to confirm if it's the killer's car. We've slowed down and blown up the video. Look right here. You can actually see the light-colored sedan just before it drives out of frame. In real time, the suspect's car races by in a flash. The murder went down in about 30 seconds, but police believe the cold-blooded killing was so attention-grabbing that someone had to have seen or heard something that terrible night. It doesn't mean that there is no one out there who has information to provide. It's just a lot of times people with that information are reluctant to come and share it with the police. So we need someone with direct information or even indirect information at this point to come and talk to us and provide us with that path that we need to go down. And according to the video, there were plenty of potential eyewitnesses. Around 2.41 a.m., when the mystery car pulls up and police believe Katie was gunned down, five cars drive by. And if you look closely, there's one car, a red midsize sedan, that appears to drive right by the killer's car when the shooting was actually taking place. Detective Eisenhower says they were unable to identify the make or model of that red car and have yet to speak with the person behind the wheel or any passengers who may have been inside. And get this, during the next five minutes from the time Katie is shot to when the first responders arrive, 17 more cars drive by the crime scene. That's a total of 22 cars and 22 chances that someone saw something. There has been many, many hours, weeks, months of time and effort that's been put into working this case, following up on information that has come in um, either by phone or email. Just there's been a lot of time put into this case. And this is not considered cold. No. This is an open case, an open investigation. Yes, ma'am. So if you were in the area of the plaza in Central Avenue during the early morning hours of October 15th, 2016, police want to hear from you. What would you tell that person who maybe hasn't had the courage or the strength to call you? I would ask them what if it was their family? What if it was their sister, their mom, their girlfriend walking home in the middle of the night? They would want someone to come forward to share that information. I want the answers. I want justice for her. She doesn't deserve to go into death not being known what happened. Her story is not finished. It needs to be finished. But until Katie's friends and family get answers about her death, they are determined to focus on her life by creating a scholarship of the arts in her name at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte.
students in the area that wanted to pursue theater or singing or art or any of the things that Katie was, was passionate about. But ultimately, there's now an endowed scholarship that will live on in perpetuity, that will be awarded every year. Katie will not only live on in all of you, but now in strangers. Absolutely, yeah. It is a beautiful silver lining. Someone must know who pulled the trigger that night, and it's time for you to come forward. Anyone with information is asked to call the Charlotte Crime Stoppers at 1-704-334-1600. There's a reward of up to $5,000 in the case. Up next, a toddler takes a deadly tumble down the stairs. But cops say something more sinister was at play. Do you understand the back of her head is smashed in? Her father's fiance, convicted of the little girl's murder, who she says is the real killer. Now, Emily DeFries gives her first and only TV interview from behind bars with bombshell claims. I know that there is someone in that house other than myself who is capable of causing each and every one of those injuries. Next. Today, we conclude our week-long series on bad parents, each one more disturbing than the next. And today, we've got a former military mom convicted of the unthinkable, murdering her fiancé's 20-month-old daughter. But did she really do it? Right now, Emily DeFries is telling all from behind bars to our Michelle Sagona. Chris, even though a jury found her guilty of this terrible crime, DeFries continues to insist she's innocent. And now, for the first time since her conviction, she's sitting down to tell us her side of the story. North of 911, where's your emergency? My stepdaughter fell down the stairs. Terrifying. She's still unconscious? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if she's breathing anymore. Heart wrenching. <laughs> These are the last moments of a little girl's life. A toddler less than two years old found bruised and battered at the bottom of a 13-foot staircase. An accident or a hidden rage that led to homicide. A jury hears the heartbreaking evidence and puts her father's fiance behind bars. But did they get it right? I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to get the truth out. This sweet little baby is Annabelle. Go, Anna. Go, Anna. 20 months old, just learning to talk. Just learning to walk. No one could ever guess that her life would be cut so short. Anna's mom, Heather, and her dad, Brandon Bell, are both Navy, stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. They're divorced, sharing custody of Anna and her eight-year-old sister. But Brandon's tour of duty as a single dad would end when he falls for Emily DeFreeze, ex-Navy, single mother, whom he meets online. They seem to be made for each other. I saw his profile and saw that he had children. He was in the military, so he would completely understand my lifestyle of staying at home a lot, going to the park, doing stuff with the kids. Within a few months, Emily and her son Carrick move in with Brandon and his daughters. It was a great fit right from the start. His children and my son seemed to mesh perfectly. Be gentle, be nice. It actually took some pressure off me. I wasn't the playmate anymore, so it, it actually made things a little bit easier to have them play with each other. But not everyone was thrilled with the new arrangements. Before I had even met Brandon's children, he had kind of warned me that his older daughter would have explosive tantrums. She would lash out. There were times when it turned towards me and she physically had slammed me into a wall before because she was big enough to move me. Despite the concerns, Brandon moves forward with his plans for a new family. At a Navy party on Saturday, May 17th, he makes a surprise announcement. He took the mic and called me up and proposed to me. So this was a happy occasion? Very much. But not for Anna's older sister. She made it very clear in the car ride home that she was not happy about us getting engaged. I tried to, to speak with her and let her know that Carrick and I coming into her family was not going to push her out, that her dad still loved her just as much as he always had. 
But the afterglow of the engagement wouldn't last even a day. The next morning, Brandon leaves early for work. Emily is alone with the three children. We didn't have anywhere to go. We had no, no pressures on us that morning. It seemed like things had been going fairly smoothly. Text messages between Emily and Brandon show everything's under control at home. She writes, got the kids watching Curious George and I'm doing my unemployment claim. Brandon responds, good, Curious George is a kid magnet. Late in the day, Emily tends to her toddler son and Anna's eight-year-old sister in the backyard. Emily texts Brandon saying Anna was taking an extended afternoon nap upstairs. How long had she been sleeping at that point? I'm not sure. I don't know exactly what time she went down. At 5.30 p.m., Emily says she went inside to check on Anna and came face to face with every parent's nightmare. As soon as I walked in and my eyes adjusted to being darker, I saw her at the bottom of the stairs. I ran over and she looked like her color wasn't good. Emily can be heard in this frantic 911 call. She's still unconscious. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if she's breathing anymore. She continued breathing. I did CPR with the 911 operator until the EMTs got there. Hours later at the hospital, Anna's panicked mom had the races in to devastating news. Doctor sat down and she said Anna didn't make it. And that's when I was like, what? And I like fell down off my chair. In the ER, the heartbroken mom sees something no parent should ever witness. Anna, she was, I could remember how she was laying. Her head was like this way. And she had a tube in her mouth and she had a bruise on her forehead. And she wouldn't wake up. So I don't know. I only got to spend like five minutes. I should have spent longer, but she wasn't there, obviously. The next day, an autopsy and shock. The injuries are consistent with a fall, but results show something much more sinister happened here. This wasn't a toddler's innocent tumble down the stairs. Something very horrible happened to this little girl. Coming up, Emily DeFries is on the hot seat. Police force her to answer the tough questions, but she shocks the cops, pointing the finger at the one person you would never suspect. I know that there is someone in that house other than myself who is capable of causing each and every one of those injuries. It's an interview you will only see on Crime Watch Daily. Emily DeFries, a Virginia mother convicted of killing her fiance's daughter. Today, she's telling our Michelle Sagona why she's pointing the finger at an eight-year-old girl. Not even two years old, little Annabelle is lying lifeless at the bottom of the stairs. <coughs> Not that one, which emergency. My stepdaughter fell down the stairs. Her father's fiance, Emily DeFries, claims she discovered Anna after the toddler accidentally took a terrible tumble. But cops claim this was no accident. They're about to charge Emily DeFries with murder. The medical examiner lost count of how many bruises Anna had on her back. She had a skull fracture over four inches long that came to a T. She had hemorrhaging in her eyes. She had bruising in her stomach from being pushed down. She had bruises around her neck. She went through hell. Yeah. Emily DeFries was the only adult home when Anna was killed, but claimed she didn't see anything. I didn't see those injuries occur. I don't know what happened. But cops think they do. Emily just became engaged to Anna's father the night before. She wanted to focus on wedding plans, but Anna wouldn't take her nap. And prosecutors say the punishment went too far claiming Emily shook Anna and smashed her head against the floor or wall, then placed her at the bottom of the stairs to stage a cover-up. Do you understand the back of her head is smashed in? Yes. They confronted me very aggressively that day and told me that I was a murderer, that I had done this, that they knew I had done this. There was no other explanation. Anna did not walk to the top of the stairs, and Anna did not fall. You placed her at the bottom of those stairs. No, I did not. Yes, she did. No, I did not. Yes, she did. They didn't want to hear anything other than that. 
I wasn't able to really explain anything or tell them that that wasn't true. I loved my life. It was amazing having full success. Yeah, and you know what? As a mother myself that has little ones at home, it can get overwhelming. It wasn't. Emily, come on now. It is time for the lives to stop. There's nothing that I'm like. Oh, the I medical examiner. Even under the hot glare of police interrogation, Emily sticks to her story. Were you offered a plea at any point? Yes. Why didn't you take the plea? I'm not going to plead guilty to something I did not do. But Emily's grilling doesn't end with the police. In her trial for second degree murder, the prosecution hammers at Emily's statements and testimony. Anna's mom says Emily's story seemed to change every time she told it. I mean, come on now. First, she fell down the stairs. Oh, autopsy results came back. Now I have that piece of information. Let me change my story because I need to get out of jail. Emily's defense attorney, James Broccoletti, says the case is purely circumstantial. They didn't know when, they didn't know how, they didn't know where, and we thought that was very suggestive of the fact that they didn't know who. But they did know how appalling the killing was. Medical experts testified that baby Anna was, quote, struck repeatedly. Blood infused her brain from shaking and slamming. Her little arm dislocated from a pulling or twisting force. And the killing blow, a smashed skull from blunt force trauma against a hard object. The brutality shocks even the prosecution's medical expert who testified, quote, you need a lot of force to break a kid's skull, a lot. I don't know exactly. I hope nobody knows exactly how much. For the record, did you kill Anna? No. I've never reacted with violence to anything in my entire life. I didn't start that day. But Emily was the only one home with the strength to commit the crime. Or was she? I know that there is someone in that house other than myself who is capable of causing each and every one of those injuries. There's only two people that are in the house that are physically capable of that, Emily and the eight-year-old. So obviously by process of elimination, uh, if it's not Emily, then it has to be the eight-year-old. That eight-year-old is Anna's older sister. And so the kids are outside, Anna's upstairs sleeping, and what you're saying is, is at some point prior to you going in and finding Anna, there's a 30-minute window, is that accurate? Yes. Where her eight-year-old sister was inside the house. Yes. It's a bombshell theory. Not everybody's buying it. So I was like, oh, here comes another lie. Lily, let's just keep coming up with more. I mean, it's straight nonsense to me. And it begs the question, why would this eight-year-old murder her baby sister? The answer, the defense argues, comes from the testimony of the girl's father, Brandon. His eight-year-old, he knows, has some issues. So he was a very credible witness. He had also talked about violent episodes and violent outbursts that the eight-year-old had engaged in and outbursts directed at the 20-month-old. And something else. Of all the numerous bruises across Anna's little body, the defense says there's one bruise that may hold a key clue. Is it the evidence that can save Emily DeFreeze? Coming up, an eight-year-old girl takes the stand. And her answers raise the question, does Emily DeFreeze belong behind bars? At the end of the day, do you believe that Emily is a killer? Now back to today's story as we continue Bad Parents Week. Emily DeFreeze sits behind bars accused of an unthinkable crime, murdering her fiance's 20-month-old daughter. She's always maintained she was innocent, and in a Crime Watch Daily exclusive, she gave her first interview from behind bars to our Michelle Sagona. Chris, Emily believes her eight-year-old stepdaughter may have been responsible for this horrible crime. But why would a jury believe her story? For the first time, one of the jury members is letting us inside their decision. Emily DeFries is on the attack. Shocking police by pointing the finger at an eight-year-old girl who was about to become her stepdaughter. 
accusing that eight-year-old of killing her very own baby sister. There are many other instances where children around the same age have killed their younger siblings. It's not inconceivable. DeFreeze has been charged with murdering little 20-month-old Annabelle. Her skull crushed and bruises found all over her body. DeFreeze's defense says it's one of those bruises that proves it was Anna's older sister who killed her, not Emily DeFreeze. In one of the bedrooms, there was bunk beds. These bunk beds had drawers that would pull out. On the drawer, there was a handle. The handle was a crescent-shaped handle. A bruise was found on her stomach area, which we felt was indicative of that crescent-shaped handle and was reflective of having been thrown against that dresser, thrown against that drawer, which then would also have been responsible for the blunt force trauma to the head. It's a clue, the defense claims, that opens up an entirely different scenario. I don't think that, and I don't think we argued to the jury, that she premeditated anything. Number one, I don't think an eight-year-old can premeditate something like that. I think it's an issue of rage, it's an issue of emotion, it's an issue of a reaction that occurred when Anna was either playing in the eight-year-old's room or playing with her toys or something that, that got her upset. And she just took her and shook her and hit her up against the thing and left her there. And Anna very easily could have crawled to the stairs and fallen down the bottom of the stairs, easily. The defense calls Anna's older sister to the stand. But when asked about her anger or whether she ever hurt her sister, she often answers, I don't know, and I don't remember. She was very blasé about a lot of things and didn't really talk in terms of great emotion about her sister or great feelings towards her sister. So it's very difficult to get anything concrete. After the four-day trial, the question is put to the jury. Who was responsible for baby Anna's death, 24-year-old Emily or Anna's 8-year-old sister? We thought that we had put a lot of these pieces of the puzzle together to be able to focus the attention on the 8-year-old, but that's a very difficult thing to a jury. Foreman Robert Baker says the jury considered all the evidence and no clear picture emerged of the moment Anna was killed. Do you believe that Emily is a killer? Well, this gets back to, is this a horrible accident going wrong? Or, you know, was she intent in, on, you know, actually maliciously wounding this child? I, I didn't see that. Less than a day later, the 12 men and women render a verdict. And despite some doubt, Emily DeFreeze is found guilty of second degree murder. You believe Emily is responsible, but you're not 100% convinced that she's the one who actually did this to this baby. Correct. You're just not sure exactly how this happened, and that is the question. That was the biggest question for me. Is trying to figure that out. I would like to have an easy answer, and there wasn't one. But ultimately, I think Emily is responsible for the safekeeping of that child, and it didn't happen. That alone may have sealed Emily's fate. Under the law, her being the only adult in the house is sufficient for the jury to find that she's responsible for the offense. The jury hands down the sentence, 20 years in prison. It could have been 40. It was a compromise, which reflected to me that it was a compromise in the jury room in terms of the guilt or innocence as well. 40 years have been very easy if we, you know, we had a video of her shaking and hitting the child against a wall or a hard surface, and, you know, it's undisputable. Uh, but that wasn't the case. So the doubt crept in. I think that's where we resolved to the 20 years almost a year for every month that the child was alive. Compromise is no consolation to Anna's mom. Why was her life only worth 20 years? You feel that the sentence should have been harsher? Yes. At first, Anna's father stood by Emily DeFreeze, but recently broke things off. Just one year into a 20-year sentence, Emily is still fighting to clear her name. Attorney Eric Korslin thinks she may have a chance. He's leading a team to appeal her conviction. I think in this case, the tragedy just really overshadowed her presumption of innocence. We shouldn't convict somebody and deprive them of their liberty for two decades because it's possible she could have done this. How confident are you in overturning this verdict? Unfortunately, not very confident. It's very difficult to overturn a verdict. Uh, the Court of Appeals is going to say the jury heard the case, the jury was there, they saw the witnesses, they made their decision. 
But one tragedy overshadows them all. Little Annabelle is gone forever. I loved her like she was mine. Um, she, I fell in love with her. She was sweet. She was a very happy baby. We did reach out to Brandon Bell, who stood by Emily during her trial to get his side of the story. He didn't return our calls. Now, you heard how conflicted the jury was, so I want to ask you, do you believe her story? Up next, is Emily lying? This guy is an expert in analyzing what people say and how they say it. We'll hear his take on whether or not he thinks Emily committed this horrible crime. That's next. I'm ready. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to get the truth out. But what is the truth? Is DeFreeze doing time for a crime she didn't commit? Many are still tormented by that question. So Cornwatch Daily brought in Stan Walters, a man who makes his living catching liars in the act. What is the key to detecting deception in an interview? Most people think it's body language. And everybody's looking for that one secret key, that one special move, that one break an eye contact, the one fidget, and we're looking at the wrong things. It's better to pay attention to the, to the listening portion, the verbal portion, and then look for what's missing or what's embellished. Stan is an interview specialist. He's been training police departments and the military on interview techniques for 35 years. We asked Stan to take a look at our exclusive interview with Emily DeFries, and he sees some red flags. The main point that uh, Michelle had asked her was, uh, tell me what happened that day. And all of a sudden, she began to drop details, and the timeline disappeared. And I could see big jumps in the timelines. So I knew that there, for some reason, there appeared to be an avoidance there. Now, that in itself doesn't mean she committed the, the murder, but as the interviewer, why am I missing these spots? Why is she skipping those points? I had tried to guess and estimate for the police what time things happened that day. And I was mistaken when things happened. Memory lapse is, is one of the most frequently used forms of avoidance. It's hard as the interviewer to attack it because you have nothing to grab onto. So it's gonna be a stalling tactic, and in that way I don't have to make up a story that could be challenged. And there's another one. Mm -hmm. The one that was really critical was when Emily describes it was a slow day, it was a free day, and, and all of a sudden she has a very specific 30 minute window, and calls specifically 30 minutes. The older sister is in the house alone, supposed with Anna. What you're saying is, is at some point, prior to you going in and finding Anna, there's a 30 minute window, is that accurate? Yes. Where her eight year old sister was inside the house. Yes. But she's not been looking at the clock, can't remember time up to here. But all of a sudden, we got a specific 30 minutes. What does that say to you? To me, that's a critical window right there. No other reference of times, no other estimates of times. How do we know it's 30 minutes? If you're not watching, don't have some representation in your mind. I know that there is someone in that house other than myself who is capable of causing each and every one of those injuries. Once she wants to push off the, the guilt or the responsibility, because through here, the whole story, she blames as being aggressive toward her younger sister. And so this block, she has to account for that block of time. If she is involved, in my opinion, that's the 30 minute block when this incident actually occurred, when she had the interaction with Anna, that Anna got hurt. And then there's this, a telltale sign right out of a detective novel. Here comes Michelle's critical question. For the record, did you kill Anna? No. Watch, watch. No. No. It's an emotional leak. Very nuanced. Very small. But a leak nevertheless. A leak nonetheless. She doesn't believe her own answer. In some way, she feels responsibility, her actions, lack of action, foul play, whatever. She feels emotionally the connection to cause of the child's death. And whether that was because she left the child alone and didn't monitor the child, or she was a principal actor in it. She didn't believe her own response. But do these clues reveal the whole picture? Is Emily DeFries telling the truth about her role in Annabelle's death? In your opinion, mm -hmm. was Emily DeFries lying? 
In my opinion, she exhibits clusters of behaviors that are consistent with someone who's withholding information. She's not telling the whole story. Correct.